Okay, so a couple years ago, I bought this ancient pre-built from a friend for $10, and I upgraded it. Now, upgrade is actually a pretty strong word, as the only things I actually kept were the motherboard and the CPU cooler, as it had proprietary mounting. This thing was never supposed to be my main rig, just a desktop for when I didn't feel like using the laptop. But, thanks to triple monitors, it's become my main rig. However, as I've been getting into more complicated video effects and blender modeling, I've been itching for a bit more power than a Phenom from 2009 and a GTX 660. So that's where this pile of parts comes in. I wanted to try and build the best PC that I could afford, but also to hit that price per performance sweet spot. This led to some choices like 3rd gen Ryzen, even though 4th gen's been out for a little bit. That's just because the added cost for upgrading to 4th gen over 3rd gen didn't really make sense for the performance gains. But let's get into that a little bit more. I'm Caden here from Kepler Electronics, and let's get started. Let's start with the CPU, as that kind of decided the rest of the build. Ryzen 5 3600 put a dent of about $200 into the cost, but supposedly has a 32% effective speed increase over the Phenom in my old box. I decided to go with the stock Wraith cooler, again thanks to budgetary constraints, but I'll probably upgrade to a better cooler once I find one on sale sometime. This brings us to the motherboard. I was originally thinking MATX, the smaller size, but decided on going full ATX for more SATA connectors, which would allow for future storage expandability. It wasn't too much more, and the added PCIe and SATA connectors, along with more fan connections and such, made it worth it in my eyes. The digital camo is a bit much, but it's fine, I guess. I did have to take off the standard heatsink mounting to fit on the Wraith, but that wasn't a big deal, just four screws. Next up was the RAM. I went with these Oloy Warhawks, 16GB kit, 3200MHz, officially supports Ryzen, and also pretty affordable. It also includes RGB lighting, and it wasn't too much more than buying non-RGB RAM, so I just went with it. Next up with the storage, I decided to go for a decently sized NVMe SSD, which would be faster than the SATA SSD in the old rig. It's a Samsung 500GB, decently standard drive. This will be the main boot drive, but I'll probably drop in some mechanical drives for bulk storage eventually. If you've been following PC components for any amount of time now, you've probably seen the graphics card market. It's kind of insane right now. To put it in perspective, the GTX 660 that I purchased for $50 a couple years ago, it's a card from 2012, that's what I was running in my old rig, uh, that's gone up in price. It's running about $100 now, almost twice the price that I paid for it, which is kind of insane. And that's a card from 2012. It's not much better, it's, it's actually much, much worse with the newer cards, where people are buying them and immediately reselling them for twice their retail price, which is ridiculous and completely out of my price range, even the lowest tier 30 series card. So that meant that I would have to go back a few generations. I decided on the GTX 980, and that was for a few reasons. It kind of hit that price per performance sweet spot that I was talking about earlier. If you want to upgrade to a 980 Ti, that's about another $100, and you don't get that much more over the 980. If you want to upgrade to a 1080, then that's, you know, another $100 over that, totaling about $400. And, you know, you don't get too much more performance to compare with that price. So the 980 was the sweet spot, and I went with this EVGA super clocked model, just because it had better cooling and slightly higher clock speeds over a reference model. The power supply is the EVGA 500 watt bronze model, similar to the one in my current rig, though I did go with a semi-modular version this time to reduce the cable clutter in the case. For the case, I wanted something nicer than my old rosewill piece of garbage. Something that didn't rock when you pushed it, something that didn't have this broken panel on the front, and also something with a tempered glass side panel. I also didn't want to spend a ton of money. I settled on the Fantex P360A, which included all the features I wanted plus RGB fans and this tiny RGB strip on the bottom. The RGB actually looks really good, and I've caught myself just staring at it from time to time when I really should have been working. I know RGB is a bit overplayed by this point, but darn it, I've been watching build videos with RGB overload for close to 5 years now, and it's super cool to finally have some. But enough on the lighting. The PC is built, and it's time to run some benchmarks. I'll be reusing some of the same game benchmarks as the previous PC build video, namely Fortnite, Minecraft, and the Talos Principle, but I'll also be throwing in Just Cause 4 and Diabotical. I'll also be throwing in a Blender render in Cycles done on both the CPU and GPU compute in the Cycles renderer. I'm also re-benching the old PC as I did throw in a slightly better CPU after the initial video, upgrading from an Athlon X4620 to the previously mentioned Phenom X4965. Let's first take a look at the Talos Principle. The old rig achieved FPS values ranging from 40 to 50 on ultra settings, which is pretty cool. 
However, even cooler is the new PC, which had FPS values between 130 and 140. Over to Just Cause, simply flying around with very high settings netted frames in the low 20s and low 30s on the old PC, compared to a pretty rock solid 60 on the new PC. On high settings, Fortnite got 40s and 50s on the old rig, compared to pretty rock solid 70s on the new rig. Minecraft, with all the cool graphic settings and a cranked render distance, was all pretty consistently between mid teens and high 30s on the old PC. However, on the new PC, it sat between 50 and 60, with dips closer to 30 when loading in new terrain. Now, Diabotical was a really open and shut case, seeing as the old CPU couldn't even run it. But the new PC did hit the cap of 250 FPS pretty solidly. However, the new CPU did mean one thing. Oculus Link was now compatible. This meant I could give some PC VR games a shot. I've been wanting to give this parkour game Stride a chance for a while, and using Virtual Desktop on Quest, I could wirelessly connect with my PC in my bedroom and play in the living room right below. Aside from some small issues caused by my terrible internet, it was pretty great. But enough on games, let's take a gander at the Blender render. It's a decently high resolution render with a lot of samples of this wireframe mech model that I made. The wireframe itself is emitting light, but aside from that, it's pretty standard. In a GPU render on the old PC, it took 2 hours and 26 minutes, whereas it took 2 hours and 29 minutes on the old CPU. On the new PC, the GPU render took 20 minutes and 12 seconds, and the CPU render took 20 minutes and 6 seconds. This is absolutely insane. That's 7.5 times faster renders. I'm not sure if Blender is taking better advantage of the newer hardware, or if that's just pure horsepower, but either way, that's nuts. However, thanks to the relatively pedestrian Wraith Stealth, the CPU does get up into the 90 degree range when running a full CPU render. That's definitely not good, and I'll for sure be replacing the cooler soon. However, as the GPU renders are within a few seconds of the CPU renders, I'll just be using the GPU for renders until that happens. The CPU never really gets up to 100% in any other context, and usually stays between 20 and 30% usage, even in CPU intensive games like Teardown, which is what you're watching right now. So those temperatures are really only happening in this one instance of a CPU render, which I can really avoid. Overall, this new PC is massively better. That's not really a surprise as it is about four times the price, but it still feels super great to use. There is still for sure value in upgrading an old machine. It helps reduce e-waste, gets you a good budget rig that would fit great as a media PC in the family room, or even as a basic gaming machine for a kid to play online with their friends. I used it as my main school and gaming PC for two years, and the only thing that actually made me upgrade was Blender Freezing. It was actually working on the Blastwave 2 video which got me to upgrade. This included a ton of animations and even motion tracking, the latter of which resulted in said freezing. The link to that video is in the description by the way, I'm super proud of how it turned out. Thank you all for watching, and have a good one.